Steve Robertson from North Ireland. Um, I just want to ask the panel and, and SOS on the whole um, about getting the case over that will show you know, the mass of non-political people the problems with it. Um, one of the big keys in the legislation that hasn't been mentioned is that the surgeries or the doctor consortia keep a portion of the money they don't spend. Um, because to sell off surgeries or to sell off anything, whether it's bus companies or chain companies, you need to make them profitable, then, then, then investors will buy. And the key here is making surgeries profit-making, and you keep basically a third of what you, don't, what you spend less in your budget. So if your budget's 10 million, you spend eight. That's the first key road down to privatization uh, and then charging in the future. So the making the surgeries or the consulting of surgeries profitable. Um, and, and we must get that over. We must get that over. Secondly, within the legislation, coming back even deep into Tory voters, um, it's a massive bureaucracy. I, I can't begin to tell you the size of bureaucracy for each doctor's. It's basically contract lawyers. Each doctor's surgery has got to have contracts with whoever they have... Uh, they, they, they have surgery deals with, you know, if, if you're going to do tonsils for my, for my patients and you're going to do cataracts, you've got to have contracts, there's contracts have got to say who's responsible if the surgery goes wrong, what compensation culture it applies. It's a massive contract lawyer's dream on anything as big as America. And you must get that over as well because that's what people will listen to. Um, uh, also, uh, accountants and auditors, obviously massive accountants and, and auditors dreamed. You're, taking, you're going from, let's say the PCTs are all bureaucratic, and some of them are. You're going from 300 um, bureaucratic PCTs to about 5,000 bureaucratic doctor consortiums. Massive explosion in bureaucracy. It's quite the opposite way to, to go. Um, and finally, IT staff. You're going to have massive IT staff. Uh, to connect in with all this. So SOS and everyone needs to get over um, not only the, the, the profit motive and the moving to privatisation, but the mass bureaucracy that this creates. Um, I just want to say one final thing that we should also watch. The problem for, um, for the Labour government and for anyone, not just in this country but other governments, is that there still continues to be, in all medicine, private and NHS, uh, restrictive practices, deep restrictive practices by the surgeons and the consultants. Um, and what happens is they do two operations on a Monday, private on a Tuesday, golf and lecturing on a bit of lecturing on a Wednesday, a couple of more NHS on a Thursday. I'm not saying they're all like this, but let's not defend what goes on in reality. Privately, you can be at a Nuffield Hospital, Beaufort Hospital, NHS, French Hospital, Swiss Hospital, American Hospital, all the same thing. Now, the United Health and the Kaiser Permanentes and the Wellnet have <coughs> broken have broken that restrictive practice. They pay good money to their surgeons, but they're told to do 10 operations a day, or, 20, you know, or 10 cataracts a day, 10 tonsillectomies a day. And the problem is, for all of us, they are very efficient by breaking that, breaking that um, restrictive practices that is in the surgery and consultancy uh, area. And that is the problem that we've all had to grapple with. It's very hard not to be tempted by these world health organisations that have broken that restrictive practices. There is not restrictive practices, by the way, in nurses and people working in the NHS. They're some of the most efficient, hard-working people in healthcare anywhere in this world, and every study's shown that. But I'm just talking about surgeons and consultants. And the problem is, is it's, very, it's very hard for any government, Britain, France, America, Germany, to not to be engaged with some of these new world health organisations. And we have to be constructive in that, as we, uh, uh, in the way that the NHS can get out of it, not a Tory government. Sorry, I've gone on a bit. That's all right. That's all right. Thank you. Could I just... Uh, yeah. First of all, as a consultant, I can't... <laughs> <laughs> that I've never played a game of golf in my life. And I'm completely at a loss. I mean, one or two people did uh, exploit the situation in the way you described, but it was very exceptional, and particularly exceptionally important there. And um, the, the private, private finance initiative has been mentioned, and uh, rightly 
to come then, but I would remind Mrs. Rowan, Rowan, the Labour government, Correct. introduced them, and she was very enthusiastic about it, if I remember, in the Courier at the time. Uh, also, I think it's a bit disingenuous uh, to talk as if um, <coughs> the Labour Party never contemplated involving the private sector. This was during the uh, Yorkshire Post, during the Labour government, uh, in which they were contracting out uh, NHS patients to the uh, private sector, and they were roofed in Halifax. They paid for <coughs> X number of cases, and they only sent X minus 10 or whatever. So, and they still had to pay for it. So there's no... Um, the Labour Party cannot contain that it is holier than thou in these respects. And I would also point out that uh, she was rather unkind about the Liberals, but uh, in fact it was William Beveridge, a Liberal who drew up the original plans for the National Health Service. Uh, and I strongly support the National Health Service. I think it should be uh, uh, deliver first class care free at the point of delivery. And that was what I was trying to make out, that these uh, proposals should not go ahead unless they could be shown to be beneficial. Okay. Linda has asked to just have a quick reply to that. Yeah, yeah. Like that. But well, I do want to speak to the people Stephen in there. as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree about the bureaucracy. It's unbelievable the amount of things that will have to be fed back from the GPs. Each GP will have to feed back to the Department of Health. It's bureaucracy gone mad. And that's just the beginning. And I urge everybody, I've got the uh, Unite the Union briefing on the Health and Social Care Bill. And I urge everybody just to have a quick look through because some of the things are terrifying. It says hospital closures. One of the most significant issues dealt with by, by the IA, that's impact assessment, is the necessity of provider failure. And ho local hospitals will have to close. And local MPs or council must not be allowed to have any way of preventing this. So it goes on to say all those MPs that have been elected campaigning against a hospital closure must vote against the bill. But we'll see what that happens. But I do urge you all, if you've got a chance, just to uh, Google this and have a quick look through. Just to answer Bob's point, I was never in favour, and you will find if you look back, of PFR. What I am proud of is a new hospital in Calderdale, provided after years of waiting for one, provided under a local government. And the MPs then did a lot of good work with the health minister, Frank Dobson. Uh, so, no, don't like PFI. And I did say in this speech, I'm not proud of Labour being involved through the NHS in uh, uh, the private sector. Well, Linda, I don't want to have a personal call with you, but I have a cutting at uh, home in which you tell the, uh, tell the, uh, the, the courier yeah. that the private finance initiative no. is the only uh, way forward on offer. It and that you supported it. Yeah. On offer. I'll, 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 I'll send on you a copy of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm now realising why I ended up changing. Yes, that's what I was supposed to do. Can I? Uh, Kevin, I was at a meeting last night. Can I, can I just bring someone else in from the floor?